Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from four exciting countries across Europe. I am joined here today by Alessio. Hello. Cara. Hi. Fen. I'm sure. And no. I... so, hello, hi, sorry. <laughs> sorry. She was gonna bark. Carry on. Hello from uh, Pam as well. And I will be your host, Alexis. We'll be talking today about Journey into Middle Health, uh, an app-driven campaign game, as well as the upcoming Golden Geek Awards and Spiel de Jahr. But uh, first, we'll start with seeing how everyone has been doing in the Stanley Catch-Up. So first of all, uh, I have to say for those that weren't in the Discord, uh, Kara has been doing uh, tremendously well at school uh, as, a, as a teacher and has recently uh, been posting on the Discord a sort of saga about a non-binary student that they have that has been uh, growing into themselves and that has been a very uh, wholesome and cute to follow. So if you're not in the Discord, you might want to uh, give it a, a look. Uh, how have you, you been doing beside that, Carl? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so beside the, the whole story of my non-binary student, um, maybe not just Cliff Notes, a student came out to the teachers as non-binary and there was a lot of discussion uh, around the te between the teachers, how to handle it, and um, <clears throat> I decided to show support by gifting a baby Blorhai, uh, the IKEA Blorhai, and uh, which was re well received. And now we had a talk with a father who really supports the student. And so, um, yeah, and tomorrow <laughs> I will uh, propose to our school that we establish a unisex student bathroom. So looking forward to how well that will be received. Um, <laughs> Yeah, apart from that, I really struggle with the weather right now. Um, I think that everybody across Europe at the moment has a similar experience. It's been yeah. harsh here. It's, I mean, it's been hot and dry for three weeks now, a little longer, and there was no rain whatsoever. And last night it rained without end, but it's still hot, so this um, morning it was just tropical and um, <clears throat> by now all the water has evaporated and it's dry again but I, I'm just oh my god um, yeah I haven't got around to playing a lot um, because of you know me buying a house and uh, doing a partial move there and my uh, flat being total chaos and um yeah that's my life right now <laughs> what about you alessio oh well uh speaking of countries where it rains too much uh, uh in italy on the other end uh, it happened <laughs> that uh, it rained so bad for three weeks that it flooded cities uh, it was terrible actually but uh, we are there i just have the the worst cold ever so that's basically what i'm doing now i'm here on uh, chicken broth and tea and stuff to try to recover i hope my voice is isn't uh, uglier than usual let's say i'll settle for that but uh, that aside uh, i've been playing a lot too uh i fi i finally got brew which is better late than never and uh, i just received my copy of too many bonds unbreakable that was the last uh, and i think last uh, for a long time at least uh, kickstarter i make it from uh, chip theory games and i find it relaxing you know uh and after that, uh, I I am actually preparing because I want my local um, local game community to uh, send me to the national uh, Italian championship of it uh, pedal to the metal. So <laughs> uh, I'm oh. actually training hard for that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's basically it. Uh, a lot of stuff happening, a lot of games being played, uh, and uh, a bit of news. Uh, that's basically it, because we will probably be commenting a lot of the news uh, later. So, uh, what about you instead, Alexis? 
Oh, um, well, on my, <laughs> on my end, as probably everyone in this call, except maybe Fen, uh, it's been extremely hot and I've been just melting at home. Other than that, uh, not too much. I've been playing a lot of, of um, Wavelength recently with a few friends. Uh, I've been uh, dragging it around whenever I, I went to, to see some people and it's been extremely enjoyable. Uh, I think that we talked about it in one of our first uh, few episodes. It's, it's for me one of the, the perfect party game. And recently I've been also start, uh, starting to replay some uh, Kingdom Death in prevision for... Yeah, we got an update! The, yeah, the, the <laughs> gambler chest that might be coming at the end of the summer, early uh, winter, so and that's going to be interesting. And that's about it for me. Uh, not too too much uh, at the present. So how about you, Fen? And apparently, uh, <laughs> she has Pam is also to say yes. yes. <laughs> she did. Um, I think somebody's dead walked past our property, mm. so she is telling them to to get lost. Uh, well, seeing as we're all sharing the weather, uh, you guessed correctly. It's been nice here. Um, this is the first day where the humidity is past about thirty. It's actually seventy, but that's because it rained for two days. Just two days, so the garden's very happy. Um, it's been nice and cool, and we've got AC uh, if it gets too problematic. And the energy costs are so low that they're in the negatives at times. So that's that's pretty interesting. I'm not sure how that works out on the bill. But yeah, uh, well, we're, we're mostly renewables on the island. Renewables, some biofuel. So that's why running electric AC isn't so bad. So, you know, uh, I I also received my um, Too Many Bones stuff. Um, I went oh. for the Trove chest to get everything organized, uh, along with Unbreakable and some other bits and pieces, Carcass and Polaris and uh, obviously the two new um, gear locks. Unfortunately, my Trove chest arrived broken. It's split in th on three corners on the front uh, and not even glued together properly. Uh, one of the top sections just isn't glued or the glue's broken and the others all have glue marks on the front. Like seriously, they may as well just sent me it flat packed so I could have assembled it myself better. Um, the drawers are okay though, but I will say that uh, support has been somewhat reasonable in responding to me. I'm sure they've got lots of people right now contacting them. That always happens with a Kickstarter delivery period. Uh, mm. So they're going to replace the core box. Um, they were talking about, like, because the front cover, there's a sliding cover, was a bit scratched and damaged. I mentioned that, and they're like, oh, we can replace that if you give us some pictures. And I'm like, no, I don't really want it replaced because I'm only going to use it when transporting the box somewhere, which isn't really going to happen. So forget about it. Okay. Um, but, you know, it's slow going uh, to try and get stuff done with them. But it, that is a delighting contrast of Vindication, which um, I'm sure at least some of you have seen uh, arrived for me. Uh, how long ago was it now? Was it like two weeks ago? About, like that. Yeah, yeah, about two like weeks that. ago. Yeah, um, yeah, no, it was. it's nearly three weeks ago now. It's into th the third week, I should say. Uh, so... The it arrived, the external box, nice, neat, all no problems. I opened it up and the interior box, like the storage box for the whole complete collection, had one of the corners concertinaed and I was like, uh oh, that that's not a good sign. But I better like open it and take a look. I opened it up and sure enough the internal box cover was crumpled, which meant the both the top, the lid and the bottom would be damaged. I opened it up to check and Every single component that was stored in that corner is damaged in one way or another. Either the plastic shattered or the cardboard is bent. Oh, and uh, yeah, so like around a quarter of the components in the game are at the minimum damaged or you know a minimum ugly, uh, and at the most in some cases kind of not really playable. Like the board has a dent in a corner that it's meant to fold out on, so it's like a pain in the ass. I have the. Um, the neoprene mat so it's not a huge deal but i contacted orange nebula immediately and i've heard nothing apart from the automated response of thank you we're very busy right now and i'm like hey, this is this is kind of beyond the period i think it's acceptable that that's uh, yeah that's unfortunate especially since they're not a small company anymore uh, it's their no. fourth or fifth kickstarter they've gone 
they've they've produced a lot of games and you would expect a certain level of quality with uh, too many bones. You definitely have that quality with the component, but you would expect it to have it across the board with our uh, uh, customer service too. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm not. I'm I'm relatively happy with um, chip theory on the whole. Although, like uh, Alessio, I'm done with their stuff now. Yeah. Um, I got Cloud Spire. Um, I was lukewarm on Hoplomachus. I'm probably going to let that go at some point. Like um, sell it. Um, oh, uh, but and um, Cloud Spire and Too Many Bones are my keeps, and I think I'm done with their stuff. Uh, like I don't see why this this stuff is neoprene and have you, chips anymore. Yeah, I, have you played their um, lock picking um, tiny game? Uh, Twenty no. strong, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, that that one is that one is quite good, and I think that the smaller scale uh, works better for their for the products. But if you're done with them, you're, you're done with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think Cloud Spire is fantastic for like a puzzle game or a cooperative game. And Too Many Bones is by far and away, I think, their best product they've ever done. So, yeah, I, I'm done. I look at Burn Cycle occasionally and go, ooh, I mean, it's about like cool infiltrating kind of stuff. But every review I've heard has been a bit meh. So, yeah, mostly that's me not playing board games. And then... I'm hopefully going to get a little period where I can talk about the board games I have been playing because I've got a load of mini reviews I want to do, but that can happen a bit later. So that's me, and Pan's quiet now. Wonderful. So quick, let's go on. <laughs> well, to start us up, I'm going to talk about a game I didn't like too much. So the game is called The Lord of the Ring Journeys into Middle Earth. Uh, and it is a cooperative campaign game for one to five player, but there's like a big caveat to that. It's set in the world of the Lord of the Rings, surprisingly enough. It's made by Fantasy Flight and preeminently use an app to handle most of its gameplay. The game is set around a number of adventures within the larger campaign. Uh, and right off the bat, I'll say that the choice is a bit strange because it's an original story not linked to any of the books in the um, Lord of the Ring canon, but you can play as characters from all over those books. So you can have a, a story with, with Bilbo going into the same adventure as Argon, but you do have some original characters too. I found that kind of strange and not specifically off-putting, but it's it's a bit weird to include iconic character that way instead of simply adding an all original cast that would better fit the story that they're trying to tell into the game. Uh, especially since I would say that the one of the main attraits of the Lord of the Ring is that, that expansive lore and that people that really enjoy the Lord of the Ring in general know that, that lore well. But somehow there's having the, those characters that, that don't really fit together is a, is a bit strange for uh, the, the attractiveness of the game, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'll just quickly comment on the characters. All of the extra characters that are in there, every single one of them is in either Lord of the Rings or Cimmerillion. They're all canon characters. And I know this because they're also in Middle Earth The Wizards, which is the best Lord of the Rings game, in my opinion. So, yeah, they, they're... Um, it's, it's a bit weird, but I feel like somebody at Fantasy Flight Games played uh, Middle Earth The Wizards at some point and went, let's use all of these guys as well, like Haldir and people like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought that some of them were were brand new, but uh, it's been a very long time since I, I tried to read the uh, Simularium, so... I mean, the the Simularium is, is, takes place a long time before yeah, yeah, yeah. the Lord of the Rings, so it wouldn't make much sense to put... Elves, the elves... Yeah, I, oh, I mean, you, you, right. you can have there you can have <laughs> Bilbo, you can have Bilbo fighting alongside Gimli. It's the canon is already gone. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's like the Lord um, of the Rings card game as yeah. well, where like everybody has a Gandalf, and then you've got like lots, yeah, yeah. lots of nonsense going on. It's not as cohesive as War of the Ring yeah. or the new Lord of the Rings War of the Ring card game. Uh, either way, the game has set you onto a battle map made out of tiles, and as you explore, the app will tell you when to put in more tiles, when to do a skill check, what enemy spawns, and what happens when you search through a clue. There's very little rules that you need to understand as you play uh, the game, because the app handles pretty much every step of the gameplay. 
The main way you'll interact with the game is through the skill checks. Uh, your character will have a deck of cards. Each of them has an ability, like an automatic success to an agility chest, uh, check, for example, or avoiding damage on the next attack or something, or something like that, as well as a success value. Uh, either a star or a leaf. When you have to make a check, you are told to draw a number of cards. Each star is one success. Each leaf can grant you a success if you spend an inspiration token. That aspect of the game functions a little bit like Seventh Continent, the Seventh Continent, except that you are reshuffling at the start of every turn. And because the deck is very small, you can usually track your odds of succeeding over the course of one turn. Uh, making the de decisions like dodging an attack during an enemy turn a bit more interesting because you, you can kind of track how much that will cost you in terms of uh, successes. Uh, because you know that you'll be picking into this, this short supply of successes uh, once again. The successes are not enough to, to, to help you through the game. You really need to gather inspiration that you can do through a couple of means during the game. And... You, and pay those successes by, by spending those inspiration points to turn leaf into stars. Each character class comes from a different deck that you have some equipments that can help you manage your deck a bit better. In between adventure, you have a camp phase that allows you to buy new skills and upgrade or exchange some, uh, some cards. I wish there was more to say about the gameplay, but the all encompassing app takes care of almost everything. The app is very serviceable. It does its jobs competently. There's no narration, though, uh, at least from what I, I, I could try. Uh, one thing that it fails hard on, though, is that it doesn't track the players nor the enemy's position onto the map. And because that app does so much of the gameplay, it feels a little bit weird that this is lacking. Because the, during the enemy phase, the app will go through each enemy, tell you their behavior. So, for example, they're going to move an attack. Uh, ask if they are able to reach the player they are targeting. If not, they will have a secondary behavior. For, so, for example, instead of moving two and attacking, they'll just move four. And it's very convoluted and turn every enemy turn into a sluggish, especially if there's a lot of enemies on the map. So you have to look at the map, find the enemy on the map, select, a, uh, select if they can reach a player or not, and then act, if the, uh, act the turn of the enemy. Um, we usually had six or seven enemy groups on the map, and they were, and we grew extremely frustrated with it, because when you you simply, if if the the game simply had one behavior uh, per enemy or a printed out card, that would probably uh, be have been a lot easier to track, uh, because there's no way to tell two enemies apart. If you have two goblins in the map, you better remember which one you put down first, because the app won't know which one is which. And they will have different abilities, uh, HP, armor, and it's, it's very important to track them to, to play the game correctly, and it adds a lot of uh, confusion. Uh, but I think that's an issue with the way that the game has been designed regarding its player count, because we played with, with uh, four players, and every turn of also we had more enemies spawning in, and an onslaught of them filling the map with uh, more en enemies that we could ever fight off on the first mission, uh, especially since the game is set on the time limit with clues spread out on multiple sides of a pretty large map, so we kind of had to, to spread around. And if we tried to, to fight every enemy, we just couldn't take, the, take care of them fast enough. We tried the first time and we, we learned the, the, the hard way that uh, we absolutely couldn't try to fight and we lost the first mission. So we played again and we learned to, to rush and ignore everything that wasn't directly re uh, related to solving the main story. And we played uh, about uh, half of the adventure uh, of the, the first uh, big campaign. And it got, it got very uh, tiresome after a while. It felt like there was way too much pressure and we ended up having almost every miniature from the box onto the battle, pa uh, onto the battle map, pretty much every mission, uh, completely overwhelmed all the time. While the story being told was at first about just having a few hawks being spotted, we had to fight the entire Hurukai army. After each game, it kind of felt exhausting, and between the interaction with the game being mostly following the app instruction and the story not being extremely engaging as, uh, as far as we've seen, because it's 
it's serviceable. Uh, it really didn't got any enjoyment out of my group. Uh, I've played it again later as a solo just for a few missions and the game is a lot more, a lot better designed for a solo player. So if you buy that one, I would not recommend it to play with more than two people. The game, if you really like the world of uh, the, um, the Lord of the Ring, I would say that it's probably a good buy. But I really there's there's so many better games set in the World of the Ring um, uh, world that unless you really need a solo game set in that world and none of the other uh, interest you. I don't really see this one as being that interesting. And surprisingly enough, uh, a lot of people liked it. So maybe I'm just a, a not liar there. Maybe you're just a curmudgeon. Uh, I want to first of all correct past Fen. There are a few unique, specific characters um, that are new to the franchise, but some of them also come from Fantasy Flight's card game, which is where I was getting my things mixed up. Um, so like Berevor appears in the card game first, so she's been around for a fair while. Um, and also stuff like Elena is there's a character very similar um, with a different name uh, that uh, I got mixed up on. So anyway, uh, they yeah, they did put some original characters see, in. See, uh, that would I, have been really interesting if they created their entirely new Lord of the Ring canon just for their board game and could tell like a story over multiple games, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Or they could have dug into all of the minor characters who are sitting around on the sidelines. There's so many um, characters who just have a name or a small scene, like Glorfindel, who's like fantastic. Glorfindel's a great character, but he's not heavily touched on in Lord of the Rings, so people are not massively familiar with what he did beyond him swooping in and doing the job that um, Liv Tyler did in the movies. Yeah, um, I, I agree. I would actually say uh, that this game there is great one or two players, but it means you have a lot of components you're never doing anything with because there's so many spare miniatures you don't need. And if you want to play with larger groups, perhaps you should look at the older versions of this, which is uh, Descent, um, uh, Road to Legend, yeah. Descent 2nd Edition, and uh, Descent Legends of the Dark as well, like same app-based but just better put together. Or even if you want larger groups, Mansions of Madness, which still holds up now they've fixed all the problems the very first edition had. So, yeah, it's... I like the idea of you take a character and then you stick like a class deck together with them and boom, you get this thing going. Um, but yeah, it seems to be a game that's divided a lot of people. Some love it, some like me, I'm like, I quite like it. But uh, since I've, I've, I've got a firm recommendation for a better solo game, which is just buy a load of old Middle Earth The Wizards cards. Um, you can get the commons very cheap and a lot of the big characters are in like common or fixed, which is another version of common. Um, and you can play Arda, which is a uh, fan-made solo adventure type thing. And you can even play that multiplayer. Um, and it's exploring Middle Earth and having adventures and all sorts of different random things happening, fighting various dragons and whatever. And you can do it on a budget of like 50 euros if you wanted to. Um, so, yeah, there's much better choices out there. Yeah, I was just about to add uh, what Fan said about the other ga app-based games like Descent, Legends of the Dark, uh, which in turn has a very terrible, terrible story. Actually, not the story, the narration, but <laughs> that's me not liking Terry North as a setting, I guess. But yeah, uh, w what this game has really going on for it is uh, the rich setting of the Lord of the Rings I have to say that Fantasy Flight uh, built a lot of lore over the lore of the world and uh, uh, the only thing that leaves me kind of warm about this title is the fact that there's the Lord of the Rings LCG which does a lot of the narrative play better also, uh, of course, of all the Fantasy Flight big campaign card games is not my favorite one. Uh, Arkham Horror LCG probably is. And uh, uh, I also would say that there is the, uh, the new edition of the World of the Ring, the card game, by Maggi and Nepitello, uh, who are Italian designers, which is uh, 
kind of very different but very interesting and uh, it's well constructed with lore which is another option for uh, Tolkien fans but basically uh, when you talk about uh, a, ga a game based on Middle Earth or Lord of the Rings you talk about all the games based on that so it, it becomes uh, crowded very fast, very fast so it does. It does. I, I'm, I'm going to bang that drum one more time, and I'm going to say that the best game is Middle Earth: The Wizards. It's <laughs> incredible. Uh, it's been out of print for over twenty years now, though. So, and it's very expensive. A few of the bits and pieces, but I've already talked about that. I think War of the Ring and the card game War of the Ring are like the second best options, and I put them on the same level as second best because it depends how what your budget is uh, both for time and like experience because the card game's way easier to get onto the table and still is very good very very good so yeah i i i think journey to the middle earth is not yeah journey to the middle earth is what like the fifth or sixth best and i'm only thinking of about six games so yeah it's yeah. it's a middling good game yeah <laughs> i mean with with the the war of the ring card game what should be mentioned it doesn't have the movie um as a base yeah yeah exactly thingy how, how do you um license license that's the word so they, i'm super happy about that it I, i'm not saying it's bad it's just something um if you go in and your impression of lord of the rings is are the movies you will be put off likely because it looks totally different but if you read the books and that's your first impression you got from Lord of the Rings, um, you might be more open to it. So um, just something to mention. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is more faithful. Yeah, it's one of the three very faithful games. Um, and like this and the Decipher Lord of the Rings game from two decades ago, which is, I think, a reskinned Star Wars, the card game. Anyway, yeah. I, I've only played the the card game once. It's the Fellowship of the Ring, the card game, right? Um, uh, that's the LCG. Yeah, 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 there, yeah, there are a lot of those. Yeah, there, yeah. there's a lot of different ones. I, I think that the, the I, I played the Fellowship of the Ring once, and it was it was really good. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, it's been repackaged and reprinted with the same design as the new Arkham stuff. Yeah, so exactly. I've been gradually, I've been gradually picking it up myself, like here and there my problem with it is that unlike arkham and marvel champions where you are rewarded for building like your own deck and themes and everything lord of the rings the lcg the mouthful asks you to make um to, to make a deck to beat the given scenarios you're playing in so it's a constantly moving target uh, which if you love deck building is amazing uh, but I like having pre-built decks. I like my deck building to just be like, I build this and I don't think about the scenarios um, and then I see how they interact. No, yeah. Uh, actually, the, the the Lord of the Rings, the card game, I think it's, its best point is that the scenarios are beautiful. There's one where you are taken prisoner, uh, where you have to recover your gear through various rooms, it's simply beautiful. I think I never seen something like that in a card game, even with the location mechanics of Arkhamor or LCG. This one, uh, the scenarios are simply so good. Well, Sen, you had a few games that you played uh, recently, haven't you? Yep. So I haven't been on the podcast too much recently um, because of health issues, but also because I've been swamped with lots of other stuff. So I've got a backlog of games I'm going to go through briefly. I'm going to leave one of them out because it's in our next topic and I'll talk about it there and why it should have won the category it's in. Um, but uh, here we go. So we'll start with from Gabe Barrett, uh, The Forgotten Road. This is part of a trio of, of little solo and two-player games that I picked up. Um, it was a cheap Kickstarter. I just did it because I liked the artwork. Um, the other two are The Last Stronghold, which is like a cut-down version of Stronghold. That big game from... Is it Stronghold Games? Um, the Siege I believe game, so, yeah. Two-player Siege game, yeah. Uh, but it's like a really cut-down version of that, uh, best way to describe it. And Hand of Destiny that I've not played at all, but that's like a one-hand solo game like Palm Island. But the one I did have a chance to play was The Forgotten Road. 
So the concept of this, very quickly, this is one player game, 20 minutes. It's all double decks with a few tokens and dice and one pawn to track your position. You play a traditional adventuring party. Uh, one of your members has been captured. You've got to travel to a dungeon and rescue them. So you will shuffle up and draw three random characters. Um, and then you will set up a road deck with a boss at the end, a dungeon deck with a boss at the end, and a couple of other decks for like items and stuff. And then you will uh, play out this road. And it, visually it's quite like fun, the spatial way that the road is created is each card has icons on the left and right of it in the top and they line up and match so that'll give you this is how many this is like what uh, what you need to achieve to get past this given uh, thing in the way or um, this is uh, this is what damage you'll suffer etc this is what the monster is and so you, you gradually have this unfolding line of cards that build up to construct the road that you're going down and then at the end you'll fight the boss um, it's all done through like dice mechanics uh, and clever playing of a hand of cards. You've got a deck that you can refresh once. You lose the game if all your characters get um, defeated or if uh, you run out of cards in your deck, you can refresh exactly once. Um, or if you get to the last uh, boss and you just can't beat it. Uh, it's quite nice. It's, it's a lovely looking production. It's very easy to pick up. And the really the thing that made me go like, oh, this is cool, is when you get to the dungeon portion, uh, the road portion has all the cards in a line, but the dungeon portion has them like offset slightly, so they descend deeper and deeper. It has no mechanical relevance, but it, it's very thematic. So, pretty good if you see it around, but if you do want to play it, get the expansion. It's an expansion for all three of the games, but it adds more characters, more variety in bosses, and that's very much what the game needs if you're going to be playing it a lot. Which, at a 20-minute solo game, you may well be doing that. Uh, then we've got Doomtown. I'm not going to go into full details about Doomtown. This is an old card game. It's been around for a long time. It had a relaunch in 2014. It's had a relaunch recently. Um, it is, they've released a cooperative set of scenarios and solo play so you can play against solo decks and you can pretty much put a deck together and the bottle handle the deck fairly well it's actually a one of the top five card games of all time in my opinion um, for, for reference the others are magic the gathering because you have to put it on the list netrunner i don't like it but everybody says it's great <gasps> it's great <laughs> yeah yeah it, it's great uh, ashes re, uh, ashes reborn ashes with red reigns is like incredible and um i've already talked about number one it's middle earth wizards it's the best card game ever made collectible card game trading card game living card game better than all of them uh anyway so uh that came out and the sad thing is they changed the texture of the cards they used to be living finish now they're this slightly greasy touch which is ick. um uh, but if you're sleeving it's fine and the game is incredible it's just really good but I wouldn't get it if you're just going to be playing solo. Um, it is at its best played competitively against other players. It's almost a board game in a card game form. Really, really good. Binding of Isaac, uh, that arrived. And then I got the solo cooperative expansion stuff printed. There are a bunch of cards on the website. I don't know if I've talked about it in the past. But I'm going to say I don't massively care for the, the Munchkin genre. Um, but Binding of Isaac played in the solo and cooperative scenarios, which you can play two player, you can either play them one or two player, is amazing. The scenarios change the rules, they really give you a lot of focus and things to do. The negative is you, you have to set up the decks. If you're just going to play with like a random pile of the cards that you've got, it is overwhelming. Uh, it's too many cards. I, and yeah. I've only played the not cooperative one uh, that it, that felt very much like Munchkin, just a little bit better. It is, yeah, it's yeah. Munchkin, but a little bit better because they've uh, they've nerfed the pile on the leader problem. But, um, but you, though, yeah. mm. you you recommend the cooperative one uh, wholeheartedly then? Yeah, yeah. If you Wonderful. if if you're willing to print out the cards, or in my case, I got them printed by MPC. Um, and they all arrived and they look fantastic. The way it changes all the different scenarios and the texture of the game is fantastic. Uh, it's just like I have the full, complete, blah, blah, blah edition and it is, it's too many cards. So I would 
kind of recommend just getting the core box set, not maybe Four Souls expansion, and and then playing the scenarios one or two player. They they definitely a lot of replay value there. Uh, yep, and then my last really quick one is two games in one, and that is they're the same system with some twists. Uh, they are Pathfinder Adventure Card Game and Apocrypha um, The World. Uh, so Pathfinder Adventure Card Game I think is done by Drive Through Cards and Pazio. Um, I'm going to mostly talk about Apocrypha here. This is a one to six player cooperative adventure game. Uh, you can play it in a guided mode, quote unquote, where somebody plays as a GM. It's bad. Ignore it. Forget about it. But as a solo game or as a cooperative game, it's really good. Uh, and I wanted to bring this up in particular because low shot games seem to have the game on sale a lot. And one of the reasons for that is they ran a really bad Kickstarter that hurt a lot of people. And that sucked. Uh, but I'm talking about the game itself separate from that. And it's really good. You can get... The World, The Flesh and the Devil, which is and the Book of the Hybrids, that's all of the content to play with, the, the, all of the stories, that is over, that I think it's a hundred different scenarios to play, and that you can get that for like around under a hundred dollars. Uh, even in the EU, getting it shipped over and paying customs, you'd probably pay under 150 euros total. Each scenario is about an hour's worth of play. If you like this, it's a ton to play through. Um, I love the world as well. It, I, I like dark, weird, urban fantasy, and this is it. You play a saint who's somebody who's like their memory's been fractured, uh, and you're kind of drawn to a place where there's some bad stuff going on. And the foes, they exist in the shadows. They can become more powerful and people forget about them. And you kind of have to be broken and have lost memories to be able to even see and deal with these things. It's a lot of Americana. It's a bit like American Gods or Buffy um, that kind of stuff, uh, but darker, uh, quite grim and weird. Uh, you have a small deck of around 12 to 15 cards that represents your life and the stuff that you're doing with your things. Uh, you're going to various locations that are decks of cards. You've got to look for a particular threat and isolate it, make sure it can't escape and defeat it within a certain number of cards drawn from a deck. I, I play it three-handed solo, um, or cooperative the interplay the team play is phenomenal with like you're helping each other you've got room to support and do all these kind of things it's amazing i almost wanted to do a full thing talking about it but i'm going to crunch it to here um the negative for apocrypha is the rule book is complete trash there's a better version that they did online but that doesn't come with the game uh, i would still recommend learning from a video tutorial but i really especially if you're in america and the shipping costs are way less like, do yourself a favour and consider getting this because it's got a 6.7 on Board Game Geek because it got review bombed. It's a, it's an 8 out of 10 game, it, like, easily. It's it, it sticks with me. I keep thinking about it. I keep going back to it. It's it's mostly the bad Kickstarter that uh, tanked it. Understandably so, but we are, like, nearly six years on from that, uh, from its original release. And, you know, it's from some people with some amazing design pedigrees and it, it slaps. Alternatively, you can get Pathfinder. Um, it's a slightly less complex game. The advantage of Pathfinder is it's more traditional fantasy and you're hunting like uh, bandits and dragons and stuff like that. And your characters level up. In Apocrypha, your characters only get stronger by you changing your deck around, which it's like almost like a legacy game, both of them. Like gradually the decks that saints have and the characters have change death can occur and you can't play that character anymore if you run out of saints it's game over entirely start the whole thing again um yeah so that's it that's the games i'm reviewing here quickly uh and i think you know if you like adventure games and you want something um pathfinder apocrypha is really good uh the one downside with pathfinder is it got redone to a second edition uh in 2018 i think 2019 and it's only had one expansion released since and they changed the graphical interface so it's compatible mechanically with the older stuff that came before it, but visually they don't look the same. Um, however, you can just like you can get two whole adventures in the Pathfinder um, like release. So yeah, there we are. That's that's my little mini reviews. Uh, let's get on to the next topic. Unless anyone has any questions. Wonderful. No question on my end. No, no questions either. 
actually. Nope. Be- before we jump into the the Golden Geek, well, the 2022 Golden Geeks, uh, I wanted to to check how everyone has been doing with uh, Kickstarters recently because I've I've not been backing a lot of stuff uh, for the past couple of years, but recently I I finally uh, bit the bullet by uh, getting into the the newest uh, ATO Kickstarter. Uh, I think that most of us have, <laughs> and I, I was curious if uh, if anybody had uh, any good Kickstarter recently. Oh, uh, actually. I have. Uh, I, I wanted to talk about them uh, when we talk about the Golden Geeks because a couple of them are improved version of some of the Golden Geek uh, runner-ups. But there's Witchcraft on uh, Game Found, which is by by David S. Thompson and Trevor Benjamin. Uh, it is uh, which themed but it uses the same card mechanics of resist which is actually pretty good uh, card mechanic so yeah resist is really good yeah exactly so so i i, I really dig it and uh, that uh, one project i backed i think uh, at the moment of, re- of recording there are still a few days on the on the game found campaign and uh, after that, uh, I think uh, I... Oh, uh, it just launched the campaign for uh, another game. Uh, let me check it because I didn't... Uh, from the author of Voyages, anyway, the solo game uh, you can print at home, they made another one which is beautiful because it looks like charting a course of, an, uh, of a tourist map it's called uh, waypoints yeah, and it looks interesting and since these are kickstarter which are basically delivered spot on because it's printed at your home it's pretty interesting too so uh these are the the, the small things i found uh, lately yeah i uh, i would say that uh, postmark games you can just basically jump into any yeah. of their kickstarter uh, eyes closed all three of them have been well all two of them so far have been uh, stellar well yeah um for myself i oh sorry car you go ahead uh, you, you go ahead <laughs> i'm going to be back in a second so you go ahead so um for me i I'm trying to limit the amount of uh, crowdfunding projects I back simply because I came to the realization that basically every open project that hasn't fulfilled yet is like weight on my mind. So something that I, I carry with me and uh, yeah, it's just um, you, you freeing also to got... have less. And um, yeah, I'm I'm one of those people who have a lot of open um, crowdfunding projects. I think I'm, yeah, I'm over forty. Um, yeah, you you also been very unlucky as they all have been uh, very yeah. delayed. Ah, uh, and um, so with my plan to back less um, this year, so since January I have backed. 10 no 11 <laughs> crowdfunding <laughs> projects which is less than 40 um, yeah <laughs> yes so uh yeah progress um but what has definitely changed it's less board games um so of these 11 only five are actually board game projects the others are uh comics or one for pins and stuff like that yeah p- pins are usually easier to deliver than than board games yeah um, the most recent um, Kickstarter I backed uh, actually came as a bit of a surprise for me um, because it's the uh, newest uh, Kickstarter from Unstable Games. Um, at this point, I forgot the name of the newest one, but I have talked about um, them before when we talked about Unstable Unicorns. Um, and there I also touched on why I'm not backing more of their games um, because I, I really like the art and I enjoy the games. They are not very heavy or very intricate as far as I can tell. But what really turned me off was all the Kickstarters basically are the same. They have this $25 light card game and then they have the $170 all-in Kickstarter exclusive FOMO bundle um, that you can only get during this Kickstarter. And that just turns me off. I, I really 
hate how they handled all of that. The game's um, name is a command of nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's very cute. I, I agree. I, I, I'm very happy we're seeing a bigger swing back against Kickstarter exclusives, which, of course, used to drive people to back on Kickstarter. And now there's more people who are getting quite like, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm fed up of this and um, I'm, not, I'm not interested. I, I'm, yeah. I like uh, uh, Simon. I'm not backing Simon stuff anymore because I'm fed up of their Kickstarter exclusives. People mm -hmm. talk about how great Cthulhu Death May Die is. And in fact, like one of my role playing group tried to get us to play it. And I was like, I'm not interested. I don't want to play because if I like it and I know I like the setting, I can't I, I can't pick up all the stuff except on the yes. secondary market. So, no, I'm not playing it. Yes. And especially with these unstable games, games. <laughs> It's like, okay, you, you have this retail version that has, it's just, you know, as an example, it has six characters in it and the Kickstarter exclusive version had double the numbers. And that's, uh, I mean, come on, yeah. And um, they, during their current Kickstarter, they suddenly started a, um, they, they basically sent previous backers emails um, asking them to, um, answer a survey where they were looking into how do people feel about Kickstarter exclusive that are limited to a certain campaign. And after a while, they decided, okay, we listen to you. We will make Kickstarter exclusive content still exclusive to Kickstarter, but it will be available. At least the, the gameplay content will be available in other campaigns from us. So with the current campaign, you can, in the Pledge Manager, get Kickstarter versions of their old games. And in addition to that, they offered previous backers a $10 um, credit for the Pledge Manager. So I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, you got me. <laughs> when I can have the option to, you know, get the core games of their games in the Kickstarter version, have a $10 credit, and if I really like a game and say, hey, I want expansions for that, so the next Kickstarter from them, I will grab the expansion. That's I, something I can deal with. But um, so yeah, I, that's really something I appreciate that they took a step in the right direction there. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. Um, for myself on Kickstarters, I am quickly going to uh, talk, like punt and say, um, Studium is close to finishing it's a new boss battler from a seattle based uh company uh it's a family company i've chatted with mac wheeler the guy behind the game behind a lot of it uh and the campaign when it launched had as people have called it in the comments a lot of red flags um and these are red flags in my opinion because of a lack of experience from the people putting it up this is like a real mom and pop um, you know family kind of project of passion it reminds me of kingdom death's like very first kickstarter when it was kind of like here's some models and this like tiny board and now we know where that is so um, that's one of those ones that i i wholeheartedly recommend people follow uh, and consider pledging for a dollar uh, if you're interested in boss battlers and maybe like keeping an eye on late pledges and stuff because I've played the TTS demo and there is some like really good special stuff in there that's new to the boss battling genre and Mac has asked me if uh, it's okay if he contacts me and I provide feedback on boss design along the way which I have agreed to because um, I, if this game turns out to be good, it's got separate hit location decks for each body part. That is so cool. You you like if you're in front of it, you can hit this thing in the head or in its weapon, or if you're like on the sides, you can hit its arms. It's yes, that's like something that's always been weird in Kingdom Death, where you stab a lion from behind and hit it right in its face, and it's like okay, I can kind of stretch my imagination of how that happened. But then you get to the Sunstalker and it's so big and you're like... <laughs> you, you know, you um, always so, eat the lion in the fancy groin anyway. Yep, yep. <laughs> and also, um, and this originally made me concerned, is they're doing an optional extra expansion called Trist, which is a quote-unquote sexy expansion. But what it actually is, is they wanted to write some more adult-themed stuff into board games because it's an area that generally people only go into adult stuff of like titillation and this has some of that but they wanted to more explore like 
romances between characters and you know have a more traditional uh, acceptance of nudity and like making it more normalized and okay to be nude um it's i i like that they they try to be mature about it whether they succeed or not we'll see and i especially like that they made it optional this isn't oh you're going to have this in there um tough luck and also being very clear there's going to be no sexual violence which that would be an immediate like i'm not yeah. backing at all if that was in there um, so they've avoided that so that's the by the time this comes out the kickstarts might be coming close to a close um but seriously if you like boss battlers you should at least owe it to yourself to go and have a look at the updates and maybe set yourself a calendar reminder to be like do i late pledge for this or not when i've seen what they've developed further down the line so there we are well that's a good turn about all the recent kickstarter that we've been interested in uh, interested on so i think that we it's time to move on to the golden geeks the 17th uh, annual golden geeks uh for the year 2022 yeah the results are out actually since may so basically uh, there are a lot of winners so a lot of runner-ups uh, as usual uh the uh, a lot of familiar faces oh uh, yeah a lot of familiar faces actu actually a lot of them and uh, uh, basically uh, one thing that is important of the board game geek awards like every year uh, is that they are community awards so it's actually uh, the people playing who vote for the nominees and then vote for the for the actual games so uh, it's a bit of a popularity contest, but something which is uh, averaged out by the sheer number of people. So basically, that's the voice of the people here. <laughs> yeah, this is what your average board game geek user likes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, what do we do? We go category by category and comment a bit. I would... I would say category by category. That would be uh, that would be the fastest, and not spend too much time on them. So for the two players game, uh, the winner is uh, Splendor Jewel. Uh, again, not a surprise, and uh, kind of a, a game that's that's been there before. Splendor is uh, uh, not exactly a surprise there. Yeah, Splendor Duel has very good mechanics uh, for two players, so it's actually very interesting. It uh, retains a playing kind of like Splendor, but uh, it is very smart for two players, it's very balanced, so it's not completely undeserved. Uh, what's, uh, what was uh, impressing uh, is that Undaunted Stalingrad, which is a, 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 a semi-legacy campaign war game to play here with a car-based mechanism made up as a runner-up. I'm, yeah. yeah. I'm not surprised at all. It's like had massive praise across the board from all of the various content creators yeah. on YouTube. It was, um, it was a, a controversial game of the year for no pun included, for example. Yeah. Um, Count me oh, in oh. about appreciator, among appreciators, yeah. anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was also a big improvement on uh, Undaunted, undaunted um, Normandy? Normandy? And North Africa, yeah. yes. The two yeah. titles before. Yeah. It's, um, not, yeah. You, I, for me, it's the worst of the three games up there, but I am firmly, I'm done with people mining World War Two for <laughs> card games. My grandparents, uh, rest in peace, we're in World War Two, and I still can't. I, I just, especially like in the current climate, and Stalingrad was just a horrible. Like it was two awful, evil empires going against each other. There was a lot, you know, and a lot of people being killed. It's hard for me to to stomach it. And also, I don't see the point in Splendor Duel when Splendor's perfectly good with two players. Wingspan <laughs> Asia should win this. That, that... Thank you for saying that. I mean, I've, I've never played Splendor Duel. I didn't even know it existed, to be honest. But, like, I thought, okay, wh why not just Splendor? W what's different in Duel? Oh, there's a balancing mechanics with the scrolls. But since I played only the Italian version, I don't know how to render it. But basically, uh, there's a way of catching up for someone who doesn't pick the nobles. Uh, the nobles are the ones who score points in Splendor, right? Uh, apart okay, uh, you have a catch-up mechanics in the scrolls, which allow you to score points in a 
kind of different way and uh, award different strategies. So it's actually smart. Uh, I find that uh, I played a lot of Splendor in uh, Board Game Arena, uh, but I, I have to say that I appreciated uh, what they did this Splendor Duel. So it's kind of interesting, yes. Uh, I don't know if I would have voted it the first yeah. Uh, no, no. Let, let's just sort it out. It's nice and simple. Here we go. Look. Uh, 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 no, no. Uh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Right. Here we go. Splendor go. Duel. Splendor Duel. Eight. Eight out of ten. Board Game Geek score. Wingspan Asia. Eight point four. Undaunted Stalingrad. I don't like it, but I got eight point eight. That's the damn winners in that yeah. order. Yeah. Get it right, people. Popularity contest. Why yeah. are you rating these games correctly? Yeah. Actually, actually, Wingspan Asia. Uh, despite I like a lot the base mechanics of Wingspan, is just more of the same for two players. I said it. Uh, yeah, send me I mean, eight mail. Do, do what, what, do what uh, you I want. I mean, the, the reason the reason why uh, every Wingspan expansion gets onto those Golden Geeks uh, winners is because the ga the base game is incredibly good. Not specifically because that expansion. Uh, brings it to new heights. It's wingspan is just always going to be yeah. an amazing game. Yeah, to play. and also because cute animals anyway. Yeah. Oh, Let, yeah. Let's get on to the la the next yeah. category before we fire more shots. Uh, like every <laughs> single one of these is part of a franchise. None of them are new <laughs> games. <laughs> Speaking uh, of a new game, artwork presentation. Yes. Uh, th no. This one is won by Flamecraft, which looks incredibly cute. Yeah, it's actually the one category where I have and have played all three games. Oh. Um, and I, I, I mean, from what I've seen, it, I totally agree with these three games. I'm, I mean, I guess I can understand and, and see how most people think of these three games. Flamecraft is the winner. Um, I would find it really hard to pick one out of these three. Flamecraft, Everdell and Wonderland's War. They are all just beautiful. It's, I've been uh, really interested by uh, by Flamecraft. I have opinions. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I <laughs> surprisingly. Really? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Wonderland's War is pretty, but I find it really generic. I don't think it's an impressive piece compared to the other two. Everdell, the complete collection, is a complete collection of stuff that was mostly released in the past and should be disqualified by default. I don't like Flamecraft. It should win. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Ben has spoken. Yeah, <laughs> I would also like to add that, uh, of course, this year uh, it won the cartoonish look, so it's okay for Flame for, for, for Flamecraft to win because it's actually pretty good. Uh, there were a lot of games illustrated by Vincent Dutre and uh, and people like him, and uh, I am just disappointed that not even. Uh, a small mention of it, pedal to the metal, or something like that. Here, why? I mean, why it, did Manny Tremby's work in in Radlands not win? Yeah, when, also when was Radlands yeah, yeah. or Dice Throne? Why is it Wonderland's War that people? Yeah, think so I, I'm, I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> well, he he pedal to the metal as like two or three of the nominations. So. Yeah, he's winner in two categories. Uh, so hey, he will yeah. get there. Spoilers. Yeah, we, we will get there. We will get we're there. Now, we're now on to the really controversial topic of cooperative games. Get, oh, get yeah. in the box. The get in the box. <laughs> I'm sorry, but there's so, only one of these three that should be on this list. The, Somebody else can mention them. The, the winner is uh, Return to Dark, to Dark Tower. The runner-up uh, are uh, Oathstorm into the Deep Wood, which is an expansion for Oathstorm, if I, and, no. uh, if I remember. No, oh, that's no, it's, the game. No, it's, it's a center... Not... Oh, yeah, it's yeah. part of game name, colon, game name. Yes. <laughs> uh, and then uh, ESS Vanguard, which was excellent. Yeah. Um, for me, I don't, I don't think Return to Dark Tower should be winning. People seem to really like it. I think it's a bit of an extravagant, like, over-excessive mess. And it's an app game, which I'm not actually snobby about. But, um, I mean, I played the original version of this and... Eh, you know, I mean, if it's an extravagant mess, it, it's it's talk, fitting it, for a franchise. Yeah, yeah. Talk about it, sure. Put it in the, the things, but why are people putting this behind Oathsworn? Uh, 
Yeah, uh, that, that's actually uh, Retard to Dark Tower is a pretty good game, uh, but Oddsworn uh, is better, a better fit for the category. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah. And uh, I, I'm also a bit disappointed that I didn't see ATO here, actually. But well, it's, I it think came that's out a 2023 in... game, really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it arrived in November, December, so not mm-hmm. only for some people, oh, it no, didn't okay, arrive for me okay. until January. Yeah. Well, with that argument, Isis Vanguard shouldn't be on this list because there are some people out there in the world who are still waiting. Like me, <laughs> <laughs> like me. I'm... I'm fine with that. Let's just strike it from the list and put some other cooperative game in there from 2022. Does anyone want to Google one randomly? It'd be better choice than ISS Vanguard, which is perfectly fine. The ship section. I, 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 I like this because uh, basically Fan is making me hate this game even before I uh, receive it. Yeah. <laughs> here's, here's the thing about this. I actually don't mind um, ISS Vanguard being on a cooperative um, thing because... The trouble with that game is I tried playing it solo to start with and I discovered immediately that running a mission like with just two sections was really frustrating. It doesn't work because so many of the tasks require like other sections to handle them. <laughs> the, the missions are all centered around like needing all four members of the away team, which makes sense. Yeah. I like that. I mean, but it's uh, too much to play solo four sections. Co- cooperative games this uh this big sometimes the so- the solo mode is just incredibly tedious and Isis Vanguard like suffers from that a lot. Yeah. Uh, with yeah. two players it's really uh really nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, oh, I love Old so Swarm, many I would say I would say Old Swarm the, the solo is, is a lot better handled, but it's also a game that I would uh that becomes so much better with two people around the table. It is fun with two people, but I do think, and obviously it's in the cooperative category, but I, I think that this um, concept of the simple heroes that they use in Oathsworn is just... It makes it so much easier, yeah. Frosthaven should be using it. I'm just saying. Yeah. yeah. Scenario 14, whoever designed that, <laughs> you you should have your pens and paper taken away from you. I, I motion uh, at it. <laughs> I'm not well, yet there. Yeah. <laughs> We uh, can it, d- just just lower the difficulty for for, for scenario fourteen in Frosthaven. Seriously, okay. it sucks. It sucks so much. Okay, so now I ate Frosthaven too. I know the rest of Frosthaven's great. That's great. We... I've just unlocked Prism and Drill. I'm so happy. Yeah, you sound hey. happy. Yeah, I am actually. I I, I don't want to spoil what they are, but they're my favourite classes. Um, I really enjoy Frosthaven, except for the odd scenario. But we need to be talking about not Frosthaven, but expansions. But the expansions, yes. So the winner is Dude Imperium Rise of X, which I have not played. Yeah. Uh, Wingspan Asia as a runner-up, and Dune Imperium Immortality, uh, which I have not played either because I do not own uh, Dune Imperium. But I if... have opinions. Surprisingly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see Excellent those choices. opinions. Yeah. Excellent choices. Yeah, uh, I, I only, I only would say that I would reverse the the order of immortality and rise of X X because I actually like immortality more. And did you fail or did I? Um. I have not played either of those two, so... <laughs> sort it out, Dune, as a solo player game, or two-player, or three-player, or four-player. Whatever you're doing, it's just one of the best games. So. Yeah, it's brilliant. And the, these expansions do so much to fine-tune and like refine and improve sections of the game that were a little lacking originally, but that didn't mean it was bad. They're just great. Yeah. Dune Imperium is just oh, perfect. Yeah, I've heard a lot of good of, uh, out of it. Yeah, there, there are also wings Spanish, there are burbs. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, that one is going to be on almost all of the. Um, uh, every time that it can be mentioned, yeah, uh, <laughs> Wings, the new the new expansion from Wingspan is going to be there. That's just the rule. Yeah, the only way to get beaten is if somebody did a version involving puppies or cats. <laughs> Speaking of, in the innovative category, the winner is Cat in the Box Deluxe Edition, uh, which is a trick-taking uh, taking game, if I remember correctly, that I've been very interested in, uh, yeah. because it, it involves some uh, fun mechanic, uh, I think... 
I think you have to to bet on what card is down playing on the kind of a Schrodinger card uh, yeah. uh, cats kind of kind of thing. It seems really fun. It looks uh, really cute. Uh, that's that's a game that um, Audrey is going to really enjoy. I think. Yeah, yeah. The the concept is that you um, you're doing trick taking and you don't know the color of your cards until you play them. It's very fun, and I have been struggling to get a copy of it anywhere. Um, I am tempted to buy one on Geek Market, but money is really tight. Um, however, it's yeah, yeah, it's a deserved winner for definite. Yeah, the, the, my only complaint here is that possibly most innovative wasn't the right category. Because... It is. It's incredibly mm. innovative. You can't have. What's he doing in this category? It's not innovative. It's Flamme Rouge with a paint job. Yeah, <laughs> it's a great game, and it is better than Flamme Rouge, but it doesn't innovate. But, but it just Fla- reiterates. Flame Rouge, but, Flame Rouge was the innovative but, one. Uh, yeah, but actually, I I don't see. Uh, there's nothing in the three games that is innovative to me, or at least uh, the mechanics are all known and used in. Uh, uh, I mean. Uh, there's it Turing machine and cat in the box. I so, have to admit, I di- I didn't to- I didn't play thoroughly. But... Turing machine is uh, really really fun, and that's the runner-up for the innovative category. Yeah, alongside with and it's it, it's, the metal. It's yeah, good it, to mention. It's fun, and it deserves to, to to be mentioned elsewhere, but ha, not how, innovative. Ha, how are you saying this is not innovative? We don't have like very many code-breaking games. The initiative was garbage. Oh, sorry, uh, Fantasy Flight. Oh, well, uh, actually, uh, now I hate the initiative even when I'm searching for a copy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want my copy? I don't want it. I've not I've not even, like, done the legacy components to it. We played it, we saw what one of the legacy tricks was, and I went, nope, and put it on the shelf. Yeah, but, but it's a code-breaking game. There are not a lot, but it's a playing code-breaking game. Is yeah, the, it's a yeah. cooperative play. Yeah, yeah. It, it's. It, I thought it was going to be amazing fun. Um, yeah, uh, Turing yeah. Mach- Turing Machine, on the other hand, looks like ass, but I suspect it might be the thing I'm looking for. <laughs> no, no. Be fair. It is not what you call graphically beautiful. It wasn't. It wouldn't compete against Flamecraft. I think it's, it's yeah, got a but... functional design. Oh, yeah, but that's what you want for agree. I just looked it up and I thought that doesn't even look like a game. But... <laughs> I mean, it's code breaking, okay, whatever. So that's that, innovative. That, <laughs> that's what you want out of a, a code breaking game. Though. No, you I, want something that. No, breaks. actually, it's perfectly fine and good. It, it is. Yeah. It, it, it is. It is. It is a hundred percent the correct design for what it is trying to be. That doesn't mean it looks classically good. It can be both. Uh, spe- speaking of classically good. Uh, to this year's the light uh, game of the year is Cat in the Box Deluxe Edition. Uh, no surprise, it seems like everybody really enjoyed it, and it's very cheap, very easy to to put in the table and to explain to people that have played a trick taking game before. Uh, I I couldn't see it not winning. Uh, the yeah. runner up is Splendor Duel. Uh, Splendor is already a uh, really really enjoyable uh, game that is that has been enjoyed by a lot of people. So doesn't make a surprise long shot i've not uh, not heard of uh, it's i think really that's good. a long trick shot's talking really, game right really good no, by a long a, shot oh it, it's a it's a push your luck betting horse Ooh. race game it's fantastic um absolutely just adore it uh, i am fine with cat in the box beating it um and i think it's a worthy runner-up yeah wonderful yeah n- uh, nothing to say really about that it's yeah, fine the- the medium game of the year edition is uh, one that Alessio uh, adores. Standing he ovation, to yeah. <laughs> to the medal. Uh, the runner-up is Wonderland's uh, War, and the runner and the other runner-up is Flamecraft. Um, medium game of the year are kind of hard to define. I guess it's around uh, 50 to 60 uh, euros, sort of, something like that. No, it's the complexity of the game. Actually. Yeah, oh, is it the complexity? Yeah. It is complexity. I don't know if it was price. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, it's complexity. These are all under a three on complexity side, although I think if I'm Brit strictly, like, I, I'd be cutting Wonderland's War out of it, um, disqualifying it and moving it into heavy, but have I don't you... think there's anything wrong. Have you played the uh, Heat, Cara? No. Ah, too bad. I've, I, I've because... actually never played, like, 
a, a run a, a racing game racing game mm. because otherwise you would have been perfect to so to tell us which one was the yeah, best yeah yeah you're keeping yourself <laughs> pure for it i understand yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um th th this is the simple thing to say about heat do you own flamme rouge yes you really don't need heat do no, you know, no, 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 no. Hey, shush, I'm not finished. Like what, shush? I'm not finished. What? I'm not fi I have my right to have my opinions, miss. You can have yours, and I know we disagree on this. But I think if you own Flamme Rouge, I don't see the point of owning heat. But if you don't own either, you should get heat. Yeah, a yeah. actually, they play a bit different. <laughs> In Flamme Rouge, you don't want to get fatigued, while on heat, you are managing your hand to... Because you actually need hit cards to perform feats so it's basically a balancing what you have and what you have left in your deck in your deck so it's a bit different uh, i it understand seems to be the yeah, more that interesting it's, of it the builds two. over it but uh, it is uh, the better game yeah Right, so on the heavy game of the year, we have uh, Carnegie as a winner, and then we have Endless Winter, uh, Paleo Americans, and John Company Second Edition. I have not played any of those. Uh, Me neither. Uh, it's it's I, very I simple. Three. The fact that this list doesn't have John Company Second Edition winning is an absolute travesty. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> Carnegie is. Uh, is very well deserved. I, I think that it's the best heavy Euro game I saw since uh, uh, Fuche Magnate. It's even better than Great Western Trail, and I appreciate it a lot. Uh, it's very good. It's also uh, a fake heavy Euro, not because it's not heavy, but because uh, the, the rules are so clear and there are no exceptions whatsoever, which is not, not a thing you can say about other heavy Euro games, that is uh, a pleasure to play. Actually, uh, everyone should have a game at it. It's also on Board Game Arena, so it's easy to play. Uh, beautiful. Uh, about John well, Company... Given... <laughs> yeah, about John Co Yeah. Uh, given that it's uh, heavy on the on the John complexity Com scale, I don't know if it's an easy game to to start uh, playing. Uh, uh, John Company's the only one of these three games I would genuinely call heavy. Like yeah. uh, the other two, uh, I definitely don't think Paleo Americans is particularly heavy. I, I think that should be in the medium category. It's the, definitely the lightest of the three at three point two five. Yeah, you know, even on Board Game Geek, um, I know stuff doesn't reach a five very easily. Like there's a huge steep curve for complexity rating, and you you know once you get enough votes, you just don't see anything getting a five. But John Company Second Edition is a four point four one, and that's like there's not many things that come close to that. It's also it does everything you want a board game like this to be doing. It's got it, it it's got a statement. It's got a thesis. It's got things to say about the time and the period. It's like historically irrelevant and important. This is a great example of, of why Great Britain is a terrible country historically and should just be yeah. the villain of all history. <laughs> it's, yeah, it, it, I, I did end up getting John Company second edition. I wasn't sure about it originally, and I'm glad I did because it is, it, it, you know, it is, it is really something special, which I don't know if I'd say Carnegie is something special. It's good, it's very good, but John Company second edition is a landmark in board games uh, the second edition uh, he, he managed to improve the the first edition which is a uh, feat in itself but but i, I uh, if you are just talking about gaming and you are putting john company and carnegie in the same category uh, i would vote for carnegie too because it's funnier yeah, that's like asking a mid, you know, a, a medium weight boxer to go up against like yeah, of course, of co at, at their peak. No, of course, of course, of course, of course, but yeah. it's funnier. <laughs> pop, pop popularity, I guess. We got another <laughs> so, great category next with some wonderful controversy. Uh, the party games, uh, which uh, the winner is Ready Set Bet, uh, followed up by Long Shot the Dice Game, which we already talked about, and then Blood on the Clock Tower, which is probably the partiest of the game because it can be played up to 20 people, if I believe. It's the most uh, partiest of game, and it I is the best game. I have two questions. I have two questions for this category. First of all, what do people understand to be a party game? And second, What's with 2022 and racing? 
it's, we're did, all did I miss something? Is it like it, it's 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 everyone's trying to keep up with like the increasing heat that's happening. So we're just all pushing as fast as we can towards big numbers. <laughs> re, re, um, racing is life. Yeah, I I don't I, I think Ready Set Bet and Long Shot the Dice game are perfectly acceptable games. Blood on the Clock Tower is a reinvigoration of an entire genre. It is the only one of the three that doesn't require a board. It should just be kicking the other two out the co- out of the list, and it should say Blood on the Clock Tower, Blood on the Clock Tower, and Blood on the Clock Tower. I but just wish three... I could play it, but <laughs> getting five people around the uh, table has been hard. J- join join the various discords that play it. There's loads of games online every week there are people playing it. It, it, it and it is a joy to play it is a joy to watch it is genuinely amazing that is i mean blood idea. on the clock tower has free playbooks so you could have just voted which of those is the best one yeah right. trouble brewing sex and violets and what's the last one? bad room rising yeah there we go boom 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 free entries for the best party game <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but I'm sorry, but for me, like, say two rooms in a boom, that's a party game. Werewolf, that's a party game. Uh, at the moment you're asking people to sit around a table, uh, who has a table that fits the normal numbers yeah, that a, party games go to? You should be able to play a party game around a uh, campfire. Yeah, yeah. Well, I am personally, uh, f- I guess, fine, but I don't think... There's only one of these three I'd play at a party. The, the next category is something that I really enjoy, uh, print and play games, uh, won by Aquamarine, which uh, is not a surprise at all. We were just talking about, uh, I forgot the name right now, uh, Roll, uh, what's the name of the people that think? Postmark Game, that's the one. Uh, Postmark Game, Aquamarine, uh, really good. Uh, Runner-up are Woodcraft and a Wayfire of Tales. Uh, I've not played uh, Wayfarer's Tale, uh, but I've heard a lot of good uh, from it. And Woodcraft is very fun, but I think that Aquamarine just grab it by by a long shot. Yeah, yeah. it's it's yeah, really I, I enjoyable. I have the full Woodcraft, and I I don't think the wrong right version should have been winning, especially not against Aquamarine. Yeah, yeah, I still Aqu- didn't play I, any of the three, so <laughs> the Woodcraft just. Um, it, it's a fun game, but I've played uh, Fleet, the dice game, and it's just so much better, and it, it felt a lot like it, just not as enjoyable. Best solo game for this year is uh, Turing Machine, which... Uh, and that's I've... where I would like to see Turing Machine, yeah. I've only played it once, uh, but I really enjoyed what I played, and I'm, I'm planning to play a lot more of it. Uh, it's, it's just a really fun uh, computing uh, code-cracking game. Mm-hmm. Uh, the runner-up is Resist. I've also heard a lot of... Another excellent good of it. game. Resist is the one that should have won. Yeah, and obviously not a surprise. Nemo Wars uh, Ultimate Edition. Any year that Nemo was there, it's going to be at least a runner-up uh, uh, because it's such an amazing game. I'm disqualifying it for the same reason I disqualified Everdell. You don't it's stop it's putting collected print. editions in. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. not a 2022 game. It's really good, but it yeah, shouldn't yeah. be here. I mean, the the same that I think that uh, I I don't really think that um, uh, Wingspan should be nominated. Uh, mm. and, uh, except for the expansion, expansion one. Expansion, yeah, sure. But is it really the best Wingspan expansion? I prefer Oceana. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just I don't think that it adds anything to Wingspan. To Wingspan, it's just a good expansion mm. uh, to a very good game. But you know, I want to see an expansion that pushes the game someplace different. Yeah. Uh, in any case, that's not the talk. The talk right now is still on uh, Resist. Uh, have you played it? I've been curious about it, but I'm not a big fan of war games. So, I'm not a big fan of war games either. I've played it. I really liked it, and I prefer the theming to it because it's quite different from your usual yeah. kind of I mean, stuff. You it's, play it's the like, Resistance, so it's like Marquee as well. I wouldn't yeah. normally play yeah. games like that, but Marquee is um, something. It's doing something different and unusual. For the tick boxes for me. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, they are different, but okay, it's the Spanish Maquis actually. The uh, res- mm-hmm. resist, but yeah, they are different, but they they have kind of the same feeling. Yeah, they are innovative and they're good, but anyway, the, the engine of resist is actually wonderful, and uh, this is where I would have to uh, uh, would have said that there's witchcraft on uh, Game Found, and it's built on that engine, and it's it 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 looks very promising. So. Have a look at that. 
All right, I'm curious about that one. Uh, for the next category, it's going to be a fight to the death between uh, no <laughs> between Fen and Alessio. No, no, no. There, the there's no, there's no contest. Heat pedal to the metal will win this. The only question <laughs> no. is why Wonders Lands War is on there. No, so it's a, the best thematic game. Uh, yeah, heat yeah. Pedal to the metal is with it? runner up Wonder uh, Lands War and John Company Second Edition. I don't uh, think John Company Second Edition would be able to win a category like this. It's good enough that it's been nominated. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, Eat Pedal to the Metal uh, has a beautiful theme, and the the mechanics are perfectly serving the theme. But that's it. There are uh, if you just uh, look at the depth of the team, uh, there are, there is a lot better around. So it, it's okay. I I'm happy that uh, Eat won another. Uh, another award but uh, it's actually thematic uh, very thematic but i don't know if it's the best so it's certainly the best there's no contest it's the best <laughs> for sure i i'm not uh, i'm not going to pretend just because i've got flam rouge and and i prefer that and i like cycling and i prefer <laughs> formula day over heat um, i'm not going to pretend that it shouldn't win this category it should it's the best thematic game <laughs> that came out for the general audience Oathsworn's the best thematic game that came out in Yeah, exactly. Oathsworn has a lot of theme, and there are a lot of others which are there's, the best. There's better, so many so, yeah. There's so many fantastic games, though. I think that people are kind of uh, tired of it. Or familiar with, so, yeah. 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 It's also, Oathsworn had a limited release, and it's not only going to get into most people's I, hands with the next Kickstarter, the, current, the one that just finished. Last year, I could see ATO on the most thematic game because mm. of how much it goes into actual, uh, or how much it uses actual mythology to build itself uh, and to create its world. Yeah, it's uh, really I, deep on the theme front for sure. Yeah, I could, I could see uh, it uh, there. But uh, for now, we move on to the next category, which is a war game and an actual war crime, <laughs> because they <laughs> picked uh, Undaunted Stalingrad over a vote for woman. And, oh, yeah. See, uh, see th this is kind of funny because, strictly speaking, all three of these games are not what your grognards would call oh, yeah. a war game, yeah. which I kind of love. But Vote for Women, I was surprised that it got onto a it war is, game. But... It, is, it is a war game. It is absolutely a war game. It's a war game with a political theme, of, and I have it, and it's yeah. right here, and it is amazing. Solo, superb. Two-player co-op, brilliant. And you can even play it two player against each other if somebody doesn't mind being against votes for women, which does cause some people cognitive dissonance. It is gorgeous. It is smooth and easy to learn. It is uh, politically significant. Uh, it is going into something that we don't see a lot. So I'm really happy to see it on these lists. I don't think it would should win this category, but I'm kind of secretly pleased it's I, on War Game. It honestly, was war. I would have seen Vote for Women win the innovative one. Yeah. It should have won something. I, I don't know, because the truth is, this is like Twilight Struggle, kind of. It's that kind of style of game. It's not super innovative on that front. It's very much area control by playing cards. Um, so Yeah, but I it's not just about the gameplay. Like The thematic is, is also really... It's oh, really, the... really good on the theme front. Yeah, di didn't it come with like uh, newspaper clips and stuff? Yeah, also? it's got tons of clips and flyers and bits and pieces. Yeah, um, maybe the maybe the thematic. Yeah, thing maybe, easily. maybe. Yeah. It's it's got some beautifully cute little like um, meeples for you to appreciate. Women waving flags or uh, this awful man in a top hat shaking his fist. It's it's great. It's so good. If you get a chance to play it, play it. Yeah. So the next category is the best podcast, and we are proud to announce uh, ourselves to have been not nominated at all. <laughs> the winner is uh, This Game is Broken, followed up by uh, Beyond Solitaires and One Stop Co op Shop. I'd just I like not to thank to our one any listener of for nominating us into the general category, uh, automated via machine, but yeah, we weren't ever going to win this, and This Game is Broken is a very good <laughs> podcast. I've I not mean, listened to any of them. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't. 
honestly, I don't understand how people can listen to podcasts, which is kind of weird to say on a podcast. Thanks, Gareth. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, welcome to The Last Standee, where we question, what on earth are you doing listening to us? What, what are you doing with your life? What went wrong? Actually, I listen to podcasts when walking my dog. Um, and or when I'm doing stuff where I can't look at a screen, like when I'm painting and things like that. But I yeah. tend to listen to, uh, I like video game thesis more than anything else. Um, people talking about like video games. So um, I, I've listened to this game is broken enough to be like, yeah, they're very good. They're very, very good. And uh, I, I listen to so many podcasts whenever <laughs> I cook, whenever I, I take a walk, whenever I, I walked on a trail or I, I go to walk. I just I'm always listening to something yeah. uh, that's it, ADHD for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, oh, my God, I'm on my own. Uh, please, someone fill the void. Talk about something, anything. Yeah. No, for, for me, like if I don't see the person talking. I, I'm I'm just tuning out. So it's it's actually really hard when when friends send me voice messages like on Signal, like a two minute voice message. It really, uh, I really need to concentrate to 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 listen um, because if if I don't concentrate really hard, I just I tune it out and then it's over and I think, fuck, what did they say? It, here's so. here's here's a quick pitch for you, right? Put Kara into a horror movie with like whispering hauntings. And just there's the ghost being all horrifying and terrifying, and uh, and and there's Kara tuning it out, just like. And someone's like, "Did you hear that?" And she's like, "What? Uh, no, I couldn't see what was saying anything, so I thought it's not worth paying attention to." Them. <laughs> Yeah, that's me. And there's this poor sad ghost. Yeah, there we are. It's called the depressed ghost that nobody wanted to listen to. <laughs> there we are. Wes Anderson can do it. He does titles like that. Has uh, for the last category of the Golden Geeks, it's a best board game app. Uh, I've not played with any of those three, but no, the, the winner is Everdell. They are runner three great apps. Yes, Aero Realms and run and the second runner-up is Role Player. A uh, Role Player actually a played the game uh, all of it and it's a really good game and, and i could see it being adapted into a really good uh, the, the app. app is excellent yeah I yeah the app is really good although it was not very good when it first came out so it's not doing great on reviews it's starting to improve a bit everdell had the same problems when it came out it, these games are kind of putting them on steam has just sort of had brought in this audience of people who expected something different um I will say I am really hope that they do role player adventures because that's Ooh, so that would good. Be nice. I, I mean to talk about it because like I I got it to play through and talk about on the podcast, and it's it's like Legacy of Dragonhold but but better, and you can completely generate a character in role player to take them off through all the way through role player adventures. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think all three of these apps are perfectly fine. Um, although Hero Realms for me, like it feels like that's been out forever. Uh, but yes. it's 2022 it, I just feel like it's been uh, the digital version's been around forever but I could just be mis like maybe it's been in early access no I, I think that the app is not or I'm confusing it with Star Realms Star Realms is from this year mm. no no, yeah. no, um, no. T- uh, like the Android version and the Steam version everything um, the release date's the 6th of um, June 2022 so it's, okay. it's definitely in that year I just feel like I just feel like the Hero Realms has been around for ages on this front. Um, Forever. I haven't, yeah, I haven't played this, um, I think, because it's got in-app purchases and that kind of shied me away from it. Um, but if they do the campaign version, I'll be on it. Because it's like, I have the physical card game and I love the little campaign versions of Hero Realms. They're great. And uh, uh, anyway, the fact that Everdell as, as an app won uh, is actually good if you consider the crit- criterion as uh, uh, a board game app should be a game that is difficult to put to the table otherwise. And the full Everdell is actually difficult to put to the table. <laughs> yes! Mm. I mean, I, I, I have this, this big box with everything in it. And when I got it, I was excited and I sorted everything in. And then I realized I will never play this. We'll reduce together. the times yeah. I will actually play this game because before, <laughs> you know, oh, I play a core game with physics pens. So I take out these two small boxes and I play it. But now I have this huge thing and I have to find all the stuff I actually need. So, yeah. 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 
uh, we have a saying in Italian which is uh, which sounds like you choked yourself with your eyes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yep. Yep. Your stomach's uh, stomach's like a small. Your eyes are bigger than your stomach. Don't yeah, you? exactly. <laughs> um, I'm just looking at the Steam Top 250 under the board game tag, and um, uh, you are not going to be happy. Uh, only Everdell's on there. Full stop. <laughs> yeah, it's got, but, a, it's but... got a 7.9 um, uh, base, 90 percent. So that's perfectly reasonable. But the other two, I can't even find yet. In the, they're not in the top 250. Yeah, but in the in on Steam, you're going to have so many games that do not uh, remotely fit the board game tag. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But I would have thought they that role player at the very minimum should have gotten that tag on it. I think it probably does. Yeah. But it's um, yeah. Oh well. Uh, I've looked at the role player app a few times, but I is it? Hang on, I I I've got to look for the reason. It's on my wish list. I've got to look for the reason I haven't clicked on it. Yeah, there's no achievements. That's that's it. That's how simple I am on Steam. Of like, does it have achievements? No. Okay, I see no reason to play this over the board game version then, if I can't <laughs> track my progress and achieve stupid goals. All right, and that's about it for the Golden Geeks uh, this year. Um... I'd like to apologise for my behaviour during the Golden Geeks. I don't know what <laughs> it is about top lists that make me get a bit antsy, um, but uh, <laughs> I have opinions. That is perfect. You fine. had the yeah. <laughs> So, that's all that we had time for this episode. Um, you can catch us over at patreon.com slash the last ND. And until then, uh, we have been the last ND. So it's a goodbye from Alessio. Goodbye. From Cara. Bye. From Than. Toodles. And from myself. But remember that the second E in Standy stands for... Ever, Everdale. Everdale, yeah. <laughs> Exasperating. I, I just I just remembered that we had that bit at the end and I was like, oh, I did not plan that one. How at do all. I do the sign out? Help. <laughs> <laughs>